Let's now talk about the polymorphic type system, the Hindley-Milner Damas system. It's an extension of a previous system, uh, the simple type system. Uh, we have all the types that we had in the simple type system. We have int and bool, we have arrow types, we have product types, uh, but we have something new as well. We have type variables, and that's because we want to have universally quantified types, so called type schemes. And it's the type schemes that allow us to express notions of parametric polymorphism. A type scheme is always of the form for all a1 up to for all ak t, where little t is a type. And we say that the type variables a1 up to ak are universally quantified. Um, if we look at a type, or rather this is a type scheme, in the type scheme uh, for all a, a to a times b, uh, the variable a is bound by the universal quantifier. b is not bound, it's free. So when we have type schemes, we can talk of free and bound type variables. Uh, in general, we will write FTV of T for the set of uh, free type variables in a type T. Um, and if we have a type environment E, we let the free type variables of E denote the set of all the type variables that are free for some type that's mentioned in E. So that way we can also find the free type variables of a type environment. Uh, for instance, if we have the type environment in which x1 has type for all a, a to a, times b, and x2 has type c, where c is some type variable. We have that the free type variables of e are b, because b was free here, and c because c was free here. Uh, so now let's return to the example that we looked at uh, towards the end of the previous uh, section of our podcast. The lead example we define a function f to be lambda x dot x, the identity function in f naught, comma f true. Um, so what we would like is for f to have a polymorphic type. For every type a, f has type a to a, because f can take an argument of any type a and then return a result of the same type a. And that's why type schemes are nice, because it make, they make it possible to express this. Um, so if we try to type the sled expression, we would give f the type a to a when we type f naught, uh, comma f true. So now we have type schemes, and type schemes make it possible to express polymorphism. Uh, we also need to be able to say that some type is more specialized than another type, or, or that some type is more general than another type. We would say that a type T1 is an instance of another type T2. We write T1 is less than or equal to T2. If it's the case that T2 is a type scheme and we found T1 by instantiating uh, the variables in the type scheme, A1 up to AK, with some concrete types. So in that case, uh, T1 uh, is an instance of another type. We instantiated the type variables. For instance, uh, if we have the type scheme for all a, a to a, then we could instantiate a to int, and we would get int to int, and so int to int is an instance of for all a, a to a. Um, we replaced a by int. Um, if we have a type t that contains three type variables, and we have a type environment, then we can build a type scheme from it, uh, by adding the quantifiers. Uh, essentially what we're saying is that if some type variables are mentioned in T but uh, we don't say anything about what they are, we can say, well, this type holds for all types A. So we can close our type T with respect to all the type variables that have not been mentioned. So close E of T uh, puts type variables in front of T namely all the type variables that are free in T, but were not free in E. So if we have this type environment that says that X has type B to B, then if we close E with respect to A to A, then um, we get for all A, A to A, 
we do not add a for all b because b is free here. So that's how we can generalize a type. We can put universal quantifiers in front of it and get a type scheme. Um, so intuitively the idea is that whenever we have no assumptions about type variable A, uh, because it doesn't appear, then it can refer to any type, so that's why we add a universal quantifier. This is something that we know from mathematics as well. If we have uh, proved uh, a result about x, but we have not assumed anything about what x is, then our results hold, uh, holds for, for any x, for every x. In fact. So um, we're almost there, and we can present the type rules. Um, we're going to say that a type is principal if it's the most general type. Uh, and a type T is principal for an expression E if it's the case that E has type T. And if we can find some other type, T1 of E, then T1 is an instance of T. So a type is principal for an expression if it's the most general type of it. And the type system uh, that we have allows for a notion of type inference that makes it possible to find principal typings. A little more about that later, and a lot more about it in the next session. Um, for the Hindley-Milner-Damas type system, there is an algorithm, W, that will always find a principal type. Namely, for any e type environment E and any expression E, we'll find a type T such that E has type T, if and only if E can be typed. So type inference um, works its way backwards and finds a type given an expression. Moreover, the Hindley-Milner-Damas type system, which is found in Haskell, is really, really nice because the T that we get is a principal type. I'm not going to dis describe this algorithm today, but I'll return to it in the next session. And it's not as a as strange as you might think, it's an algorithm that closely follows the intuition that we should use when we try to find the type of an expression ourselves. This is probably the major selling point of the Hindi milner damas type system, apart from it being very expressive, namely that we can find types. We don't have to specify them. We can automatically uh, compute the types of expressions if, um, if our expression can be typed at all and the type that we get is the most general type of the expression. Uh, so now let's look at the type rules for polymorphism. The first one is the rule that says that if uh, we have that X has type T, where T is a type scheme, and we have a type T that's an instance of T, then we can conclude that X has type T. This is very useful because this tells us that if we have uh, an X with a very general type, we can always specialize, specialize the type uh, in a setting. Uh, we'll see that we can, we can take a polymorphic function such as the identity function F that we saw before, and in some settings F has type int to end, and in other settings it has type bool to bool, and it's this rule that allows us to do just that. Now the let rule is the other rule that has changed in the polymorphic type system, and here it is. In the let rule, we want to type an expression, let x be e1 in e2, and we want to give it a type t. How do we do that? Well, first we need to type e1, the local expression, and we assume that it has some type s. And then, what do we do? Well, if there are type variables in the type s, that uh, were not mentioned anywhere else in the sense that um, they were free in S and they were not free in E, then the type S that we have is a, a, uh, is a valid type for all the type variables that have not been mentioned. So we close the type, meaning that we add universal quantification in S. And we use that as the type of x. And then we type e2. And we use the same type environment as before, but with the added assumption that x 
now has the polymorphic type that we find by by closing S. And um, this way we get uh, a type T, and that's a type of E2, and that type is the one that we get here in the conclusion. Um, to sum things up, let's have a look at an example.